All right, thanks for watching. And today I want to prove the bear category theorem because I went to Berkeley and go bear. And it's a very interesting result. It says the following. So suppose S is a metric space that's complete. So it's very important that it's complete. So if SD is a complete metric space, and U1 up to UN, so sorry, UN from N from 1 to infinity is a collection. So it's an infinite collection of open and then sets. then the intersection might not be open, but it's definitely dense. Then the intersection from n from 1 to infinity of un is dense. Dense with me. Uh, and the reason I'm covering this is because the proof is super, super neat. So let me go through the proof. What do we want to show? We want to show if uh, x is in S and r is positive, then the ball centered at x and radius r intersects all those uns. Meaning that that is, so x uh, so that is, there is some some y in bxr with y is in um or let's say un for all n. And the way we're going to construct this y is with the limit of a sequence, which we'll define now. So step one, if you'd like fix fix x in s and r positive and consider the following thing so the ball consider the ball centered at x and radius r well first of all since u1 is dense it has to intersect that ball that's by definition of denseness. So since U1 is dense, the ball centered at x radius r uh, intersect with u is non-empty. So in particular, there is some point x1 in the intersection. But we can say more than that, because not only is this dense, it's also open. Right? That's u1. Okay. But since uh, bxr intersect u1 is open, because the ball is open, and u1 is open by assumption, What we know is actually we can fit in a very small ball in the intersection. So a small ball of radius r1. So there is, is x1 and r1 positive such that the ball is included in that intersection. The ball centered at x1 and radius r1 is included in that intersection. However, we can say more than that, because if we make the radius small enough, we can even say that the closure of the ball is included in the intersection. So just make the ball very tiny to actually also have the boundary be in that intersection. And not only that, without loss of generality, we can also assume R1 is less than 1. Okay, good. And then the nice thing is, well, we can just continue that way. Since it was so much fun, let's play that spiel again. 
this is step two. Again, since let's say u2 is dense, we know that if you take our new ball, the x1, r1, intersect u2, that's not empty and open. Therefore, we can also fit a ball inside the new things. So u2 and b, x1, r1. So this is x1 with radius r1. And what this is saying is we can fit a new ball, b, x2, r2. There is x2 and well r2 with a loss of generality is less than one half, okay, such that b x2 r2 again with a loss of generality closure is included in b x1 r1. You intersect or you two. And then what well, we can just continue that way. So inductively we can define the following. So step three, therefore get a sequence Xn of points and radii Rn with Rn, again without loss of generality, is less than 1 over n, and b xn Rn is included in the intersection of the previous ball, xn Rn minus 1, intersected with your new set un. So this is xn Rn. No, if one, this is the intersection on the one hand of the ball centered at xn and radius rn. No, uh, centered at xn minus 1 radius, uh, centered at xn minus 1 radius rn minus 1. You intersect it with the new set and you obtain this new ball, bxn rn. Okay, closure and we assume it's included in the following. Now, the idea is the sequence, well, it's getting smaller and smaller, at least in radius, so actually this construction will make xn uh, be forced to converge. And in order to do that, let me just prove a little lemma that um, uh, will actually kill two birds in one stone. So step four. Simply lemma might be obvious to you or not, but if n is bigger than m, then xn is always included in the past ball. So no matter uh, which ball you pick, rm, so xn, rm, if you just consider, you know, the intersection of the, the smaller and smaller balls, then any future xn is actually included in that ball centered at xm and radius rm. And this is, might be obvious to you or not, but that's just by construction. So here's a quick proof. Okay, suppose what we have is that xn well, we know that it's a ball centered at xn and radius rn, which is uh, included in the ball centered at xn radius rn closure, but by construction, this is in the previous ball, intersect un, but then that is in the previous ball. And you see, you can just continue that way. That is in the closure. So in bxn minus 2, rn minus 2, etc., etc. So just continuing like that, we get that eventually it's in bxm rn. All right, very good. And it turns out this way you can show that it's Cauchy. 
So uh, I think two, three, four, maybe step five, claim xn is Cauchy. Not too bad to show a proof, uh, let epsilon be given. Let capital M be one over epsilon, because the radii were like one over N, then if M and N are greater than capital N, without loss of generality, we can assume one is bigger than the other. So without loss of generality, N is bigger than capital N, but then What do we get? Well, uh, then we have that d, the distance. So, um, by our claim, we know that the future xn is included in the past ball. And therefore, by definition of a ball, so this is xm and this is rm and this is xn. Well, the distance between xm and xn and xn was less than rm, but then rm by construction was less than 1 over m, and then m is bigger than capital N, so 1 over m is less than 1 over capital N, but that's 1 over 1 over epsilon, and that's epsilon. And therefore, xn is Cauchy, and because our space is complete, so since s is complete, xn, I want to write converges to x, but we already use x in the beginning, so it converges to some y in s, and I'm claiming that this y solves our problem. And we need to show two things. So claim y is in um for all m and y is in bxr. Okay, so how do we show this um, proof? Fix m. Then what do we know? And by the way, so far you're like, where did we really use the closure? Well, not yet, except for now. Fix m, then for n large enough, so for n bigger than m, remember we have our little lemma, we know that xn is in the ball centered at xm and radius rm. However, this is included, of course, in the ball centered at xm and radius rm closure. Now, you have to understand what we have is xn is in that fixed ball. The point is this is constant or fixed. So what we get, all the terms of the sequence are eventually in that fixed ball. So this is xn, all the xn's after xm, and this is this fixed ball. Well, because all the terms of the sequence eventually are in that ball, the limit of that sequence is also in that ball. And this is why we need a closure to ensure that it's closed. So since it's true for all n, Again, at least bigger than m, we get that the limit, so y, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of xn, is also in that ball. However, what do we know about that ball? We know that, you know, for, for I think obvious modifications for m equals 1, uh, we know that this ball by uh, construction is included in b x m minus 1, r m minus 1, intersect u m, but then this is just a subset of u m. So what have we shown? We've shown that y is in u m. 
And since m was arbitrary, this is true for all m. And the nice thing is we can show the other thing very similarly um, also. What we know in particular, we also know that y is in, uh, by this thing, is in b x1 r1 closure, but we assume that's included in uh, b x, uh, what's called, um, xr intersect u1. But then, by definition, this is also a subset of bxr. So y is in bxr. And therefore, we're done. We found a point in that ball that's also in all of the ums, and therefore, the intersection of um is dense. All right, thank you very much.